So, the live action One Piece. It is now on Netflix, everybody. Based on the anime series and manga of the same name, One Piece is about a young pirate named Monkey D. Luffy. This guy in a straw hat forms a crew in order to journey to and reach the Grand Line, a mysterious chunk of the sea filled with unspeakable danger and adventure. This way, he can fulfill his dream of finding that legendary treasure called the One Piece and become King of the Pirates! He and his unconventional ragtag group of ne'er-do-wells fight the greatest pirates on this or that side of the East Blue and beyond. It's definitely one of the best pirate stories out there, and it's even better that it's an anime form. But because it's Netflix, you may feel a little uncomfortable about the series. It's no secret that the platform hasn't handled anime to live actions very well in the past, and these days, audiences' taste for modern cinema have soured inconsolably. And that's because there's not really anything worth watching on TV. So audiences are in need of a serious palate cleanser. It just so happens that I have watched the entire season of Netflix's live-action adaptation of Oda Echiro's beloved pirate story, of which he was heavily involved. And after seeing the first episode, I'll be honest, I ended up binging the entire thing. And then afterward, I watched an entire season of anime One Piece for fun. I answered that call to adventure, and that was for most of the week, which is why this review is only coming out now. <laughs> We'll talk about what happens in episode one, and then if you'd like to stick around, I'll be giving my final thoughts at the end of the video. In the meantime, if you haven't had a chance to hit that like button or share this video with your friends, that would be awesome. And hey, if you're feeling ultra spicy, consider becoming a subscriber so that you're up to date on what kind of thing I've got going on. As always, this episode of my One Piece review will contain heavy spoilers. I'll give you a few seconds to decide if you want to keep watching. And as a show of good faith, I present to you a musical special, sung by Grammy winner and also my cat, Plato. Yeah, 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 yeah. On second thought, let's just make like the main character and get straight to the point. So the show kicks off with a good old execution, as all good series do, and everyone's invited! Gold Roger, a legendary pirate, is about to be written off the show only 30 seconds in, for various crimes he committed. Admiral Garp, whom we will refer to him as for this video, can't wait to make an example of him in front of the entire population, a method that will surely strike fear into the hearts of other wannabe pirates across the sea. He's all like, You did this to yourself, boy. Now you must suffer as all pirates must do. Any last words? And Gold Roger's like, uh, uh, Just a few. What if I just give all my treasure away for free? And Admiral Garp has a hernia right there and then. He's like, Wait, what? But it's too late. As the citizens of the city who hear this lose their collective barnacles almost immediately. Admiral Garp is like, whatever, and orders his guards to stab Roger with two spear tips in his back. But not before Gold Roger says, <laughs> my treasure's in the Grand Line. Go and find it. Like an absolute boss. We then see thousands of innocent people instantly abandon their jobs and families to seek a theoretical treasure of infinite wealth conjured up by a crazy man on death row right there on the spot. Pretty amazing that so many were willing to believe him. I mean, really? How are they so sure? He could have been lying. I mean, he's a pirate. <laughs> I just imagine this little five-year-old girl who sees her dad run off into the desert. She's like, Daddy! He's like, sorry, honey, I gotta go find a treasure. Anyway, the Admiral's day is obviously completely ruined. Got a feel for the guy. All he wanted was to execute this man so that he could prevent other pirates from trying their hand, and he was gonna do it in front of thousands of people. But in the blink of an eye, those thousands of people have been successfully converted into pirates. All because Gold Roger opened his mouth. Not to mention, this is probably likely inadvertently set in economic crash in motion. It's a lot of paperwork, Admiral. Gold Roger, by the way, is laughing instead of dying. What's so funny? I mean, besides the sick burn you just gave the Admiral on a silver platter, you're about to die, my dude. If it were me, I'd be screaming in agonizing pain. I mean, there's two spears sticking out of his back. I'd be like, ah! But I don't know, I guess I'm old fashioned. Mow. You couldn't survive a spear attack. Don't be silly. Mow. Yeah, right. It'd make a kitty kebab out of you, son. Speaking of old-fashioned, we jump forward in time to Monkey D. Luffy, whose small boat is sinking in the middle of the ocean. After casually explaining his dreams of forming a crew who find the One Piece, as well as him becoming King of the Pirates, 
He pulls a monkey in a barrel <laughs> and a bout of desperation to survive the water. Luckily, he ends up floating into a scene straight out of Master and Commander. One pirate ship blowing the other up, basically. What's really cool about this scene? It's mostly practical. Luffy's barrel is taken aboard the attacking ship by unwitting crew members. And Captain Alvita, a throwaway but decent enough introductory villain, has some people tied up. Captain Alvita, who is searching for the pirate hunter named Zoro, learns from the prisoner that he is on Six's island. We also learn that Zoro has a list of pirates he's taking out based on notoriety. The old captive says that Alvita is unfortunately not on that list, as she's not that notorious. So naturally, Alvita gives him a turkey club to the face. Then she forces Kobe, one of her timid crew members, to mop up the blood. <laughs> Based. Later, Kobe finds a stowaway Luffy in the bowel of Alvita's ship. Luffy tells Kobe his plans to journey to the Grand Line, and immediately, Kobe is swept away by Luffy's self-confidence and uplifting personality. Luffy reveals to Kobe the joys of living the life of a pirate. We then see a flashback to Kid Luffy, who tells his friend slash mentor Shanks, a famous and powerful pirate, that he will most assuredly join Shanks' crew. Shanks, of course, laughs off this notion, claiming that Luffy knows nothing about the outside world and is not ready yet to join a crew or be a pirate, for that matter. Luffy, of course, reacts by doubling down in the form of stabbing himself in the face. <laughs> Ouch! Back in the bowels, Kobe tells Luffy that escape will be impossible because Alvita has been malnourishing her crew and brainwashing them into believing that they can't live normal lives without her. Luffy challenges Kobe's resolve, telling him that he shouldn't let anyone, let alone a selfish pirate like Alvita, tell him what to do. Kobe clearly isn't sure about this and feels Luffy is insane for even suggesting a trip to the Grand Line, as it's rumored to be a pirate graveyard, of which none return. Luffy's like, cool! <laughs> And Kobe tries to help Luffy quietly escape the ship while everyone is sleeping. Unfortunately, this doesn't go well as Luffy sucks at being quiet, inevitably awakening the entire crew. Alvita shows up and she's like, you're not Zoro, who are you supposed to be? Luffy then tells her his name and that he'll be king of the pirates, as he always does. Alvita laughs in Luffy's face, demanding acknowledgement from Kobe, putting her cruelty and insultry on full display. Kobe begins to doubt her power over him though, and Luffy solidifies how insignificant her influence is by calling her a sea cow. Naturally, she freaks out and tries to kill them both, and this is where Luffy begins to show how powerful he really is, and in my view, where he starts to shine as a character. Inaki Godoy's performance as Luffy starts off a little jarring to me at first, I'll be completely honest with you, but by this point, I'm kind of warming up to him. Of course, I reserve full judgment so that I can see how he fares as Luffy moving forward, but so far, he's doing a great job. I mean, he captures the best parts of who Monkey D. Luffy is, and we find out in this scene that he has stretchy powers. Kobe watches in pure amazement as Luffy easily evades her attacks. In a fit of rage, Alvita tries to pull a fast one and kill Kobe, but Luffy gives her one piece of his mind and then gives her the old gum gum pistol. Don't panic, I'm not being lewd. It's just his finishing move. That's a thing you're going to see in this show. People having finishing moves and giving them names. With Alvita being defeated, her crew and Kobe are free. Luffy then convinces Kobe to come with him. Now this, in my opinion, is an overall pretty generic opening. The funny thing is, it's also very faithful to the source material, although I believe they cut some of Alvita's story out. You're going to find that they cut a lot of stuff out if you are a fan of the show, but they packed so much in at the same time. You'll find that they had to crunch a lot of the story together in order to hit all the important and most exciting parts of One Piece. How audiences react to this will depend on if they've seen One Piece, the series, or read the manga, or if they're just coming into the show and they're finding that they enjoy it, maybe they won't care. You may be upset with a couple of changes. I was a bit bummed myself about one of them in a future episode, but I see overall what the showrunners are trying to do, so I can't dock them for that. These changes really didn't pull me out of the immersion or anything like that. It's just something of note. Also, the CGI I find to be passable. How they stretch Luffy around is what it is. The CGI appears to serve as the story rather than taking a front row seat, so that's a plus. Also, Luffy's powers are pretty fun to see in live action. I've always been a big fan of Luffy. That's just my bias shining through, but I really liked it personally. We then cut to one of the coolest characters in the show, 
Rora Noah Zoro. This green-haired alpha male is the one that Alvita was afraid of, but she's been pistol whipped, so I guess it doesn't matter. Zoro is trying to mind his own business and light some candles, but an emissary named Mr. Seven approaches him on behalf of Baroque Works, a secret organization full of powerful people. Mr. Seven extends an invitation for Zoro to join them and informs him that anyone who refuses dies. But Zoro has his own thing going on and gives Mr. Seven the finger, before telling him that if they really wanted to kill him, they'd have sent someone better than number seven. That's such an awesome line. Anyway, this offends Mr. Seven and he tries to kill Zoro. Zoro responds by drastically reducing the man's life expectancy. That was a pretty brutal, but admittedly awesome kill. As is the rest of the scene. Really well done. The action choreography, the candles and the lines, it's genuinely fun and a welcome introduction for Zoro. Makenyu, who plays the pirate hunter, strikes a fine balance between cool and collected but determined and intimidating. The difference between this Zoro and the anime version are noticeable though. Uh, this version of Zoro is a bit one-line-ish for now. Later on, I feel this direction plays to the character's benefit, but I'd just like to point out that McKenyu's delivery, while great, is a bit on the quiet side. Hard to hear sometimes, but it's not that big of a deal. Back on the jetty, Luffy and Kobe discuss their plans after their escape. Luffy reveals that he has ambition, but no map to show for it. And after Kobe begins to regret leaving Alvita, a side effect from the constant psychological abuse she put him through, Luffy reassures him with, you guessed it, a flashback. In it, Shanks is tending to Luffy's self-inflicted wound. Luffy is determined to convince Shanks he's ready to become a member of his crew because of what he did to his own face. But Shanks ain't buying it, claiming that he didn't earn the wound he inflicted. He's right, of course, and Luffy is devastated. And he goes and sulks in an office. I guess he just gets hungry in this scene, as he finds a gum gum fruit hiding in a box, which is hidden in a corner, which he conveniently spots with his eyes. I feel like this is a rather basic way to show how Luffy gets his powers, but it is what it is, and it works just as well. So Shanks and his crew are chilling out at a bar, but then he's confronted by a bunch of pirate hooligans who can't have a proper good time without starting trouble. The three idiots threaten Shanks and break a bunch of dishes, but Shanks shows an excruciating level of patience and starts sweeping up the mess instead. The bullies persist, but eventually leave, prompting Luffy to yell at Shanks for letting people walk all over him. Shanks tries to explain that just because you're confronted with violence doesn't mean you should always respond with it, but in the process of telling Luffy this, Shanks discovers that Luffy has powers, suddenly feeling shocked and ashamed. If you haven't yet noticed, there is a lot happening in this episode. I'm more amazed than anything that they're able to pack so much into this episode without driving the audience absolutely nuts. It's an impressive feat, and a method that I hope they stick with because I don't even know why, but so far, this adaptation, despite what it's missing, is still really, really well done, and I have to give them serious, serious props. Anyway, back in the present, Luffy slaps Kobe in the face. Okay, not for no reason. Kobe's lifelong dream is to be a Marine, but he doesn't say why. Luffy announces his joy for Kobe wanting to do something so noble and encourages him, which is something Kobe isn't used to. The two then formulate a plan to retrieve the map by breaking into a marine base in Shellstown, and on the way, help Kobe achieve his dream of joining the marines. Elsewhere, we finally meet Nami. This scene is a fairly cut and dry mirroring of the original One Piece. Nami pretends to be lost at sea, and these two moron pirates help her by helping themselves to a treasure chest she's trying to hide. They fall for what is obviously bait, and Nami steals their ship in like, five seconds? That's Nami in a nutshell for you. She's a survivor. Back in Shellstown, Luffy and Kobe wander to a wall full of wanted posters. Luffy wonders where his face is, and Kobe suffers from a little PTSD. Nami and Zoro then visit the same bar as Luffy and Kobe, with Zoro intent on collecting the bounty from the dude he sliced to pieces earlier, and Nami hoping to score a properly fitted disguise from an unwitting marine using her femininity. A little girl comes by to offer Zoro some rice balls with chocolate, but she accidentally bumps into a snobby blonde guy, <laughs> dropping the rice balls. The blonde dude is extremely cruel and threatens her. Hilariously, I might add, this guy is really funny. You just love to hate him, but Zoro shows him what a real man is by eating food off the floor. The Marine tries to pick a fight, which is also kind of weird. There's clearly a cut-in-half body protruding from a sack right next to this swordsman. Like, really, what are you doing, man? Anyway, Zoro proceeds to beat the tar out of him and every single one of his Marine buddies without even breaking a sweat. 
Luffy witnesses this entire fight, making note of Zoro's incredible fighting skills and mature demeanor. I think we can all see where this is going, but I also really enjoyed the fact that the fight choreography implemented the environment of the bar. That's so cool. Using chairs and unique fighting moves helped the fight feel more authentic to me, and I think that's what's been missing from a lot of combat scenes lately. Oh, and Nami uses the ensuing chaos to knock out a marine and take his outfit. Guess what? Nobody notices this. Zoro corners the blonde marine, and then the marine craps his pants before offering Zoro anything he desires, since his father is the head of the marine base. So Zoro decides to let him live, taking both he and the body of Mr. Seven to his father for payment. The marine's daddy, unfortunately, turns out to be Axe Hand Morgan, a violent and borderline psychopathic leader of the marines who is also neglectful of his son. Sure explains the kid's nasty behavior, though. Morgan offers to pay Mr. Seven's bounty to Zoro in full, but since he assaulted the guy's kid, only on one condition, that Zoro choose a punishment, either by joining the Marines or hanging in a field for seven days with no food or water. You know, like the Romans used to do. Zoro chooses the seven days so that he can take a nap because he's a total boss. He's a Chad, bro. I, I, you're just not going to stop Zoro. He'll do anything and still walk away, somehow. On the jetty that night, Luffy and Kobe discuss Zoro's fighting skills. Luffy tries to lift Kobe up, who is still suffering from Alvita withdrawal, but he eventually admits to Luffy that the reason he wants to become a Marine is so that he can help people who can't help themselves, bringing the two closer together before Luffy spots an opening in the Marine Fortress. If you think that's a lot that's happening right now, just wait, it gets even better. So Nami, posing as a marine, joins the ranks of a troop patrol before slipping into the base. I think it's a bit dorky, but also kind of charming that there's this funny, overly dramatic way that these marines march down the street. They wave their arms all crazy, it's very anime-like. They certainly aren't holding back on the accuracy of the show, especially the production sets, which all look hand-built and colorful. Anyway, we find Zoro tied up to a post. Bummer and Morgan's son comes out to taunt him, having also stolen Zoro's sword. Zoro claims that after seven days, he will teach the guy a really good lesson, but the Marine reveals that Axe Hand Morgan has no intention of letting Zoro leave the yard alive. Whoopsie! Luffy later shows up and meets Zoro, having snuck into the yard via underground aqueducts. Luffy reveals his own plans of a life of piracy and invites Zoro to join his crew. Zoro laughs off the invitation because he himself is a pirate hunter, but Luffy points out that Zoro is an amazing fighter who stands up for the weak, questioning if Zoro truly believes hunting pirates is all he's worth. This sends Zoro's head spinning since all Luffy is doing right now is spitting straight facts. Luffy then frees Zoro and leaves him to think on his offer. You know, the way the characters interact with each other here is probably my favorite thing about this show so far. Perhaps it has something to do with Inaka's performance or Makenyu's performance, but these two have some excellent chemistry, and that's just such a relief because it's one of the biggest things I was worried about with this show. Anyway, back to it. Nami searches what I can only assume is the map room of the base, and is caught in the act by a guard. Because of her conversationalist skills and stolen marine uniform, Nami almost lies her way out of the situation before the marine she hit on at the bar earlier sees her and calls her out. In classic Nami fashion, she proceeds to Donatello the crap out of both of them with a staff. Quick thought. Many people will overlook this scene as a so-so, you're not supposed to be here scene, but what I find impressive is that Nami lies so confidently and effectively that if not for the other marine crashing that party, Nami would have succeeded in convincing the female guard that she didn't even know her own job. My guess is this was the showrunner's way of introducing us to Nami and her skills because in the anime, this scene does not exist. While we're on parties being crashed, Luffy arrives! Nami panics and puts up the guard facade again, but Luffy's like, nah sis, I had you figured out from the start, and I like it. And she's like, nah, and then Luffy's all like, alright, well, nice try with stealing my grand line map. Later, a shocked Nami can't help but follow as he aimlessly wanders the base. Nami tries to slow Luffy down, but nothing will likely ever do that to the Straw Hat, so instead, she simply goes with him. Then BOOM! Axe Hand shows up. But thankfully, he's stupid, as Nami is able to play to his ego, claiming she was assigned there because she wanted to work directly under the great Captain Morgan. Yeah, 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 tell your jokes now, let's get it out of the way. The ego stroke works, and an elated Morgan walks away. Luffy is astounded by Nami's speaking skills, and even more amazed when she shows him the keys to his office, revealing that not only is she a survivor, but also a thief. 
who stole the keys from the axe hand while they were talking. This is a really nice and wholesome scene. An excited Luffy compliments her variety of talents and invites her to the crew. But this angers Nami as she expresses to Luffy her undying hatred for pirates before walking off. But Luffy, being the awesome main character he is, just laughs it off. I just love this guy, man. I love how he enthusiastically stampedes through every situation and conversation. That's because you haven't met me yet. What did they find this guy? Such great writing for Luffy, by the way. The writing in this show, in general, in fact, is pretty stellar. Considering the material they had to work with after condensing so much of the original One Piece, it's tough not to talk about how cool it is to see one of my favorite childhood anime being treated with so much respect. <laughs> I honestly thought I'd never see this day come. Wow. <laughs> I'd love a tissue. Thanks. We also cut briefly over to the Axe Hand's son brandishing Zoro's sword like the idiot he is, without clothes. Which is probably why Zoro is laughing hysterically on the inside, because he caught the guy in the act. I'd be laughing too. I think it's so satisfying when the jerkbags who are mean to little girls in shows get owned in the most humiliating and vulnerable way possible. Anywho, Zoro says he has something special planned for this heathen, much to the naked man's dismay. Across the fortress, Luffy and Nami make their way to Captain Morgan's office, where his self-admiration is on full display. There are statues and paintings of him everywhere. The two search the office, and Luffy asks Nami why she became a thief. She responds that she never made that decision, but did what she had to in order to eat and survive. Luffy agrees since he loves food more than, well, pretty much anything. After tinkering randomly with wall decor, Luffy activates a secret contraption that moves Axe Hand's entire desk over to reveal a safe in the floor. I chuckled when I saw this. In the cartoon, Nami finds the map in a cupboard hidden in a corner of a room, but the guys running this live action make finding the Grand Line map this over-the-top mystery reveal, like it's been waiting all season to happen. This isn't a gripe per se, it's just that it's such a Hollywood thing to do, you know? We found the map! Move the desk! It doesn't take long for Morgan to discover that he's been duped, and the megalomaniac returns to the office to break in, Shining style. Nami tries to focus during the ruckus to unlock the safe, but they both realize they're out of time as Axe Hand gets close. Luffy has an idea and uses his raw strength to pull the safe out of the floor with Nami's help. This leads to their escape through the window and into the courtyard. Also, because Luffy is made of rubber, his body completely absorbs the fall. Then without even taking a moment to breathe, Luffy and Nami just start wailing on Marines. They go absolutely nuts on these guys as the camera just whips around them. Luffy takes off his hat, does barrel rolls and stuff, and Nami is basically just like a ninja turtle. These Marines get pwned. But then it gets better because Zoro arrives. Too bad he's about to leave. He ain't gonna be part of this in any way whatsoever. Or is he? I mean, they are getting their butts kicked out there, and Zoro's about to run away. The Straw Hat guy did kind of free him from captivity. And he told him that he was a great fighter. And he may have also invited him to a life of freedom and adventure. You know what? Maybe leaving isn't such a good idea! And Zoro just launches into the swarm of marines, slicing and dicing them before rolling into a three-way side-by-side pose with Luffy and Nami. Gotta say, the music in this scene and the show overall is lit! The three pirates then realize they're all working together, just in time for Axe Hand Morgan to drop in and say, Hi! From the looks of it, he's not happy. I guess watching the subordinates that you personally trained getting pulverized by a few street urchins does something to your soul. Morgan sees nothing but red and boasts about being the sole person to defeat the Black Cat Pirates. No one knows who that is yet. Morgan views pirates as scum who need to be eradicated with no exceptions and vows to curb stomp these fools. But the Straw Hats do not see themselves as fools, however, and have this sick epic fight with the Axe Hand. It's a really cool fight, honest. We get to see Luffy do a cool stretchy kick among other things, and Zoro takes out his third sword in epic fashion to show he means business, which is totally hype, okay? It's really hype. Ultimately, they defeat the Axe Hand, because why wouldn't they? Luffy then makes that quip about heroes calling out their finishing moves, and Zoro thinks that's Cap. Zoro then picks up the safe with his own raw strength, and the three make a getaway to the docks, but not before two things happen. One, the blonde idiot shows up with a bad haircut to take the pirates in. 
Kobe shows up right after with a right hook. Boink! He then tells Luffy that he's inspired that the Straw Hat believes in him. He vows to join the Marines and become great, but also says that the next time he and Luffy meet, they may be enemies. But Luffy just smiles and says that for now, they're friends. And the pirates depart. It's all very one piece. Elsewhere, Admiral Garb, the admiral from the beginning of the episode, takes a snail call from a mysterious person. Dude, I am so glad they made the snail phones a thing. They're totally a weird thing in the One Piece universe, and I just love them. It makes me trust the showrunners because I feel that if you put the snail phones in the show, at, at this point, what won't you put in the show? That's what we want. By the way, I think the snail in this scene is practical. It doesn't look CGI. It moves like it's animatronic, but that's just me. I could be wrong. Nevertheless, Admiral Garp discovers that a Grand Line map was stolen from Shellstown and that a pirate with a straw hat was responsible. This clearly affects Admiral Garp and he announces a change in the Marines' plans to go after the straw hats. Elsewhere, once more, a pirate that you may have missed during the bar scene, it's quick and you'll miss it, reveals to his leader that other pirates stole the Grand Line map before they even had a chance to take it. The leader turns out to be Buggy, who is a pirate and a clown who promises to kill whoever he must in order to get the map before cackling maniacally. And that's it for episode one. So, what are my thoughts? What can I say? I was hooked from start to finish, not just for this episode, but for the entire season. We've been needing a show like this, and it being such a successful start to what could have easily been one of the worst disasters for Netflix and for anime adaptations in general is nothing short of a miracle. Oda Echiro's being hands-on with this project is a godsend. I truly feel like we're seeing his vision for One Piece in live action. The camera work does seem shoddy at first when you watch it, but it grew on me. And after some time, I realized that the shots are mimicking what was done in the cartoon, which is why they look so stretched, fishbowled, and angled at times. Of all the live action adaptations, this show is the most faithful of the bunch. They change a lot, mind you, by reducing storylines for some villains and removing, adding characters and scenes altogether. But I'm not upset by that because all of the scenes so far feel in service of the story and making it work rather than making changes just to be edgy. I feel like they just had to do that, and again, I'm amazed they were able to get so many episodes broken down into only eight, and still pack so much into the season and make the character interactions so exceptional. I especially love the snail phones, like come on dude, wow. Episode 1 does a great job of throwing anime accurate characters into a world of real practical sets that also look accurate. Most importantly though, it's the storytelling and character arcs that the new showrunners are being so faithful to. And I believe that if they stay on track with that method, they'll easily satisfy the old fans while gaining new ones. The character arcs are the best part of One Piece. I want to see them explored and I want to see them fleshed out because almost all characters in One Piece are very interesting and the plots for each of them go very deep. Inaka Godoy, who plays Luffy, wow, you guys seriously lucked out with this guy. Imagine if they had picked someone who couldn't play Luffy. But they did, and his performance works, with such an infectious approach to the role. It makes more sense to see characters like Nami, Zoro, and Kobe be so drawn to Luffy and so willing to help him out when Luffy himself seems like a character that anybody could relate to, and that's exactly what they did. He points out his peers' flaws, and he tells them how they can be overcome at the same time. He compliments their strengths and approaches every situation with joy and determination. Of course Zoro and Nami will follow him, because he treats them like people and tells them to pursue their dreams when everyone else in the East Blue says otherwise. He gives them genuine purpose. I seriously hope the showrunners do not mess this up in future seasons because I love what I see so much and I feel strangely inclined to protect it. Regardless, I can't wait to share my next review for the show. I'm already writing it as we speak. With all the garbage out there these days being masked as entertainment, this series will hold a special place in my heart as being the only thing worth watching on TV this year so far. The question is, however, did you enjoy it? What did you think of this episode of One Piece, and what didn't work for you? If you haven't watched it yet, why not? You could be doing so much worse than this show. That being said, Plato and I appreciate your time, and as always, we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Later! Meow, meow.